I am Piers Rudyard, CEO of RDX Works, a core developer of the decentralized finance protocol Radix, a public ledger entirely focused on bringing DeFi into the mainstream. This is our podcast, The DeFi Download, a show about decentralized finance and all things crypto, where we dive into the details of the projects, assets, and services that are powering the DeFi revolution. Today, I am joined by Reggie Middleton. Disruptor in Chief, 2013 founder of DeFi, active patents in Japan and the USA, predictor of boons and busts, inventor of P2P capital markets and self-sovereign finance. So welcome, Reggie. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you. So that's quite a, quite an interesting um, sort of profile you've got sort of in terms of inventor of DeFi and, and P2P capital markets. So take me back to the start. And, and how that sort of came about. Well, it's not uh, a story for the Oscars. Uh, definitely not this year, at least. You're not, sl- you're not uh, slapping anyone on stage this year. <laughs> no, I'm not. But I guess like the Oscars, it was well scripted. So um, I was, uh, I'm, my background is investment. Um, I fancy myself to be a valuation expert, uh, heavy in a global macro, and old school fundamentals. You know, cash flows, assets, liabilities, money, profits, economics, things such as that. And uh, in 2010, one of my clients, I ran uh, the Boombus blog, which was an advisory. It was basically a blog, but uh, I had some pretty heavy hitters that were willing to pay a decent amount of money, for my opinion, because my opinion was outside of the box. Um, I had no um, ulterior motive or incentive to do anything besides give what I considered um, is prudent fundamental device, advice because I use my own advice. I ate my own dog food. Because hiring your own analysts are not necessarily cheap, I found a way that I can actually sell the product after I consumed it, which helped offset the cost. And the consumers of this um, product were happy because it was as unbiased as, can get, as they can get. Very different from sell side Wall Street. So one of these clients asked me to look into Bitcoin in 2010. I ignored him. He asked me to look into it in 2011. I ignored him. He asked me to look into it in 2012. If you guess what I did, right? Mm -hmm. I ignored him. So in 2013, I'm like, this dude's quite persistent. Let's take a look at what he was crowing about. And uh, first thing I saw, I went to the Bitcoin wiki. And I saw the description of smart contracts and my jaw hit the ground. Then I went to the white paper and I'm like, this is a very, very, very good idea. Um, this was June, 2013. Mm-hmm. Um, I, after going through it, I called around and um, asked for working examples of what was described. Um, I spoke to a very prominent figure in the industry. I'm not gonna name him, but very prominent. He's a developer. And uh, he said, there is no working examples. He says there's some sample code snippets, but you know, they haven't been tested. They're just proof of concept. Why not? This is a phenomenal idea. So I got with the developer, we threw a couple of things together and um, I was convinced. I dropped the advisory business almost completely and delved into uh, crypto in mid year 2013. Um, When I saw it, a lot of people looked at Bitcoin at that time, and they saw the lowercase b prices going up and down, Mm -hmm. irrelevant to me. They saw money remittances. I saw the use case, but it's limited, despite the fact it's prevalent around the world. With the advent of built-in guardrails that had minimum costs, easily commoditized. Good idea. Everybody's going to do it. There's no money in it, and it doesn't revolutionize the world. It does change it. But the smart contracts were a totally different situation. So that's where we started. So I took the ISDA, which is an uh, acronym for the International Swap Deals Association, yep. standard agreement for swaps. Yep. And I mushed it into uh, a blockchain, a smart contract, basically. Right. Um, the ISDA at that time was about 93 or 96 pages. Yeah, it yeah, says yeah. 93 pages. Uh, out of that 93 pages, about 89 to 92 pages had to do with counterparty risk and credit risk. And right. Basically, right, make sure right. I don't screw you, you don't screw me. By using the blockchain as a common counterparty, you were able to eliminate all of that. And then you had basically between one and a half to four pages left. 
And that was the gist of the logic behind the uh, BTC swap is what we called it. Right. So we basically created a swap. We swap Bitcoin as the transmission mechanism. Yeah. A data fee goes into the Bitcoin and it just, you know, the price for each side, depending right. on which side you take. Right. And that data fee can be anything. We used uh, a data fee for stocks, bonds, commodities, uh, currencies, interest rates, etc. Sure. So an or basically an oracle based system you of the type that u m a is of the type that sort of a bunch of you would you you see now today smart contracts around where you go oh right. you and I've got a bet here's the threshold here's an oracle feed and if and if the oracle triggers above the threshold then this person wins and if it or triggers below the threshold then that person wins you know for right. for lack right. of a better word right right and it wasn't binary you know it was uh gradual. Uh, we threw a couple of bells and whistles in implicit leverage, which is just a multiplier of the data feed. Um, uh, we catastrophic rollback uh, is what we called it. It's basically the ability the to oops button. Yeah, the uh, yeah, or you could say that too. Uh, not quite that magical, but uh, basically the ability to put the participants back to ground zero in case one of them were to go offline, bad actor, etc. You know, things that would replicate as closely as possible the traditional financial um, method without the credit and counterparty risk that came. Right. Um, the first swap closed in 2013. Um, we took the bugs out, got it to work predictably and reliably early 2014, and we put it in beta testing for years. Um, so what was, the, what was then, the project called then? Like, was it a public project? It was public. Um, we made it public early 2014, but it okay. closed, the swap closed privately in 2013. It was called UltraCoin. UltraCoin, um, okay. Yeah, that was just a marketing moniker. It's no coin, it's just a name. I mean, same um, time as like MasterCoin, right? So you like you got yeah, MasterCoin, yeah. <laughs> UltraCoin. <laughs> yeah, coin, coin, you know. And then um, we re-monikered it to uh, Veritasium. And uh, that's the start. That's how I got deep into uh, Ver crypto. Veritasium. Yeah. That sounds like a Latin mashup of truth and element. Is that right? There you go. There, yeah. there you go. Okay. Not many people get that. And I thought it was rather <laughs> simple, but there you go. <laughs> go show how nerdy I am. <laughs> okay. So you renamed it to Veritasium when? Well, the concept the entity was always very tasty but we, okay. we named it from ultra coin of very tasty the actual product there was a alt coin uh feces coin uh that was called very um ultra coin and i didn't want any confusion there was okay. always some confusion they were writing off coattails we had a real product they had a thing so okay okay and so you when when did this launch as a as a platform? Did did it ever have users, or does it have users now? Um, well, it was in beta, but yeah. it had we had a decent amount of users. It had maybe a thousand users, okay. all told, a few hundred um, trading value. We had limits on the amount of value that could go through because we wanted it to. Uh, we didn't want to the DAO incident. Let's put it that way. And by the way, this was at least what four or five years before the DAO. Okay. But um, I thought it was proven to limit the amount of value that goes in until, you know, we pulled the bugs out, which would have taken some time because the platform we were working on was a beta hmm. and everything was beta. The entire industry was, was alpha, it's not even beta or MVP. So um, it looks like I was correct, at least in that point, because those who are a little more aggressive in putting out proofs of concepts, um, if you do bring a lot of capital, you bring a lot of intellectual capacity who tries to break that capital and right. uh you know not a game so so what 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 uh, is it still running or did you did you stop the project no i stopped the project a we ran out of money and b um that was early days and the um what was the name of the uh i forgot the name of the legislation legislation came down in 2014 um that forget the name of it, um, big, big piece of legislation. And it, it included um, swaps and, deriv and derivatives. And it could have been interpreted that our software, which from my perspective was software, could have been interpreted as a swap execution facility. 
Okay. And a derivative platform. Right. I didn't build it and look at it as a derivative platform. Right. I viewed it as software. Right. Didn't want to have that discussion. I folded it down voluntarily before I got, you know, the knock on the door from the Alpha Boys. Got it. Which came anyway, unfortunately, but, you know, I tried. Okay. Interesting. Okay. And so, so you, um, but you, you filed a patent uh, around this time? Yes. Or we is filed it the 20, original patent. 2015? No, we filed the original patent in uh, early 2014 um, and then filed another one and filed a few more and um, shortly thereafter. So quite a few were filed. Similar family, you know. Um, Got it. But all the priority data 2014. Because the, uh, yeah, okay. Because I, I was trying to find that. I looked up your patent on the uh, patent public search on the US, the 11196566, that has date filed as 2015, fifth, uh, 2015, tw- year 2015, fifth month and fifth day. So patent law, intellectual property law, is, think of, you're familiar with uh, medicine. So you have an internist, you know, a general practitioner. Yeah. Patent law is like a frontal low specialist in uh, brain surgery. Uh, Crypto patent law is like a frontal lobe specialist on aliens. Uh-huh. So it's very, very specific. So it's not, it's a highly specialized uh, practice. So what you're looking at is the date that it was filed in the, for the USPT, USPTO system. Okay. The uh-huh. priority date is the date that is given from when it was first filed. So it was first filed in it's first filed in April, but we threw that, put another one in in May. So May 2014, that's the priority date. I think it's May 9th, but I'm not sure. Okay. It's filed as a provisional. Then you have a year, right, for the provisional. And then after the provisional, you have to file the permanent. That permanent is filed a year later. That's probably the date that you're looking at. There's another date that you'll find as a publication date, roughly 18 months after that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then other dates, dates, dates. So oh, it's complicated. Yeah, honestly, if, if, you're not, if you're not well-versed <laughs> in patent law, you know, it's it's not straightforward. <laughs> if, it was, if they made it straightforward, then you wouldn't have to pay lawyers the thousand dollars an hour to read things like dates, right? So. Right. Okay. Um, okay. So, like th- this, this is this is twenty. Oh, yeah. Pa- priority claim. It says priority claims for application claims priority to U.S. provisional platform fi- filed on the 9th of May, twenty fourteen. There we go. Okay, understood. So, what what made you decide to file a patent at this point? Just prudent business, you know. You start a business, you print business cards, you you know get a telephone. Um, if you're in an intellectual property game, you should file uh, patent protection. At the time, I didn't have a specific use for the patent protection, but I, if I were to succeed, or even if I were to fail, I said there's a good chance I'll have a use for it down in the future. It's like I mean, insurance, you know, you, you you get insurance, you don't plan on hitting anything, but it does come in handy when you have accidents. So. So I'm going to I'm going to like take the other side to this argument because I think it's a really interesting one and it's one that we've actually had internally as well. Like we filed imagine. we filed we filed patents previously and then we've sort of decided not to use them in any way. And the reason that I, you know, so like for me <clears throat> the whole of the crypto space is is built on this sort of like foundation of open source software, right? And the uh-huh. open source software um is is designed around this idea of giving away ideas is the fastest way to build human innovation. Like if you, if you build something and you, and you make that code available for anyone to use and the intellectual Mm -hmm. property of what that code does, the functionality of that code, then you can end up with a, you can basically make the, the, the sum greater than the parts in the same way that an ant can't claim any given part of its uh, of an ant nest, but the ant nest itself can be ginormous and an incredible. You know, it's probably the, a bad analogy, but like, be, bear with I'm, me. I'm working the, with you. Bear with, with work, you. work with me on the analogy, <laughs> right? So, like, open source software is one of the greatest pieces of of human cooperation that ever ex- has ever existed, and like, is the basis for us being able to do things like blockchain and like servers and. Um, you know, the phones that we use, like Android software, or the, you know, the, the um, everything that, that is more and more, or the thing, the software that we base on, uh, base our, our everyday lives on, runs on open source, right? And mm-hmm. patents feel like 
in in the in the crypto community in the open source community feel like this sort of very corporate very like aggressive way of dealing where you're going i i'm going to i'm going to take all of the stuff that everyone else has uh, invented for granted and i'm going to include that i'm going to build on it but i'm going to make this little thing that i've built my property and no one else can use that mm-hmm. um so like i'm not sure it is just prudent business practice i think that it's i think that you know like acting in in sort of like good faith with the crypto community that that feels like it goes in the face of of that and and indeed even the basis of what you started with bitcoin which is you know open source free software okay so i don't disagree with anything you said factory but uh, not all of it was factory. a lot of it was uh basically ethos and opinion yeah a hundred percent a hundred percent yeah so, yeah. I mean, if you want, I can, do you want me to counter your ethos? Yeah, or C- counter my ethos. Give, <laughs> give me, give me the, it's not corporate. It's, oh, it's, you know, okay. it's, it's, it's healthy for the industry. Well, uh, let's put it this way. I'm going to, it is what it is. What is IP? What, is, go, what, what, is, what is intellectual property? I mean, it depends yeah. on the branch of intellectual property. You could have, you can have intellectual property in copyright. You can have it in design rights. You can have it in appearance. You can have it in patents. Patents. You can have it in uh, inventions. Inventions tend to have, with patents, have to have a novel step. So the patent is generally, if we're talking about intellectual property in patents, is generally a a unique human idea that. Um, provide some novelty or significant improvement in an industry such that that person as a result of inventing it deserves to have a, a, a limited monopoly right for a limited period of time on it. Okay. So that was a very smart way of saying it's property, correct? So it's, no, it's like, it's it like, pro, like prop, there is no legal definition of the word term property. There's, there's real property, there's intellectual property, there's like shows in actions, there's like rights, but not uh, rights and obligations as warrants. Like all of these things could be classed under the broad category of property, but there isn't like a legal definition that just says property is. Property is many, many things in the law. And we as a human race kind of go, well, we think that these things should be ownable, right? Uh-huh. Um, and we designate the rules around owning them and they change depending on what hu- field of human endeavor it is. So like, it's not a smart way of saying property because property isn't a one definition of things. Are, are you in the US or are you in the UK? I am in the UK, yes. Okay. I'm going to make this US centric because my UK law is, yeah. So okay. I'm, I'm not being a, a US centric nationalist. I just don't know a whole lot about UK law. I know yeah. enough to get myself in more trouble than I get in the US. Okay. Which is a lot of trouble, by the way. So, um, so we have this thing in the U.S. called the Constitution, and it's basically the basic premise of law in terms of human rights that almost everything else is built on. Yes, also. agreed. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Sure. Um, and in the Constitution, um, the right to intellectual property is mandated. I think it's the Fourteenth Amendment. Um, goes to try how much I know, but I think it's in the Fourteenth Amendment. <laughs> and even though the word patent is not written. Yeah. The rights to property for things made and discovered is written directly in the Constitution. Sure. Yeah. Um, and most of, almost all of commerce in the U.S., and I'd say worldwide, is based upon the ownership of property. You were yeah. mentioning open source software. Open source software is not antithetical to patents. You know, you can patent something open source. Patents simply mean you have property and you have ownership over that property. Ah, but it's antithetical to the ethos of open source, if not to the actual. I, I'm not saying that it doesn't it doesn't stop open source existing, but it certainly is anti- antithetical to the ethos of the philosophy of open source. No, well, that means if I if I patent something on open source, it that means I am working against myself. There's no reason why you can't do both. So if you can open source pat- something that you own, yeah, let's hear the scenario. Yeah, yeah, this yeah. is. Now I've had this discussion often. So, sure, you you can um, patent it and open source it. I agree. Right. So, do you have any property that's not intellectual, personally, that you're willing to share at least? Sure. Discuss? I mean, like it, it, uh, like physical property, yeah, house. yeah, houses, you have a yeah, house sure. or yeah. an apartment. Yeah. So you have an apartment. Let's say you have an apartment. Okay, it's in your name. It's mm-hmm. your property. Your real property and your personal property. So there's yeah. two categories of covers. Okay, you can let somebody stay in there for free. 
As a matter of fact, the only reason you can let somebody steal that for free is because it is yours and you own it. Sure. You have title to it. Sure. Right? A patent is title to intellectual property. You have legal title to your real property through the deed. Okay. Yeah, but that, but, the, but that that is comparing ownership of something physical and separatable and tangible from the art concept of the ownership of an idea, and I don't think they're the same thing. And like they, they are, it's property. They are. See, mo- most in the open source community are attempting to bifurcate the definition of property. Here's a towel. I'm in the gym, by the way. Here's mm-hmm. a towel. I mm-hmm. own this towel. It is my property. Mm-hmm. Okay. So let's say I own the title to the prop to the towel, and this towel is not physically here. Under U.S. law, the towel is still mine. Okay, so there's a difference between real property and personal property. There's a difference between personal property and intellectual property, yeah. but they're all property. They're all covered under the U.S. Constitution. I mean, okay? it's, it, it, intellectual property is a fiction, right? Like it is a is a is a legal fiction that we all agree to because it it we like. The reason that we have it in the first place is because we think that it, it rewards people for invention, right? It's like, why would I, why would I spend, it's a classic example, I'm a pharmaceutical company, why would I spend all of the money researching drugs to find a molecule that's really easy replicated, but actually the finding of the molecule is the difficult bit. Why would I spend all of that research to do it? But the thing is, is that that molecule existed before the pharmaceutical company discovered it. They right. just so so like it, they, you don't suddenly create property of that molecule. You create property of the idea of the application of that molecule. But the thing is, is that that already existed. It didn't. It just was discovered. It's the difference between me saying that because I've discovered a star, it's my star. I mean, maybe well, that, that sounds convincing, but it's not accurate, which is part of why it sounds convincing. The USPTO, and yeah. trust me. The patent that you referenced, the 566 patent, I fought for that patent for seven years. Yeah. Seven years. Yeah. You'd be hard pressed to find anybody who fought as long for a patent. Yeah. Okay. They are not going to give, and we just had the, the CRISPR um, yeah. DNA, the CRISPR patents just went out. Yeah. USPTO does not give out patents easily. It does. On, it does. Compared the, to all other jurisdictions, really? it does. Like okay. you don't really test the patents when you go to the USPTO. You you do in the UK. You do in Germany. You do in the European Union. Like, have you got a patent in Europe? No, but the reason why we haven't had patent in the Union is twofold. Number one, the patent process is different. Okay, sure. and the patent application was written for the US. Number two, Europe is one of the weakest markets. Okay, if you go by go by um, GDP banking, financial system, economy, clarity of laws, et cetera. The U.S. fails in clarity of laws horribly, and I'm not going to make an excuse of it. I have an issue with it, so I'm, I'm putting that the way. But in terms of uh, political power, geopolitical power, um, global macroeconomic power, et cetera, the U.S. is number one. Number two is China. Number three is Japan. Mm-hmm. Okay? You have to clump 17 European nations together to rank anywhere near that. Right, but you can That's get a European patent. You... Yes, you can. But there, and the reason why we didn't get it, and we may get it, who knows, you know, we're working on it, is that the patent system is different. Yes. Okay. And now when you bring this up, okay, I'm going to make up, I'm going to bring up two points, or three points. Number one, the USPTO is not going to give you a patent on molecules. And the reason is because, as you said, molecules were in existence. But if you come up with a novel way of manipulating the molecules to do something else, yeah. that is your invention. And that's yeah, what yeah. you get a patent on. Okay. The way you presented it was as if you're getting a patent on molecules. That's not going to happen. Yeah. And it shouldn't happen because you didn't invent molecules. But if you invent a way to use molecules to create time travel and yeah. nobody's ever created time travel, then that's what the patent is on. I want when that you molecule. conflate those, <laughs> now when you conflate those, it makes a very, very Convincing argument, but it's also a disingenuous argument. Okay, so now the second point, I have to go through this quickly because my memory is very bad. Um, (laughs) (laughs) It is, I'm not going to lie. So um, the U.S. has the largest patent system in the world. Yes. Okay. Um, And it has the most deepest, the most diverse. China's catching up quickly, but yes, they're currently the biggest patent system in the world. Now, who has the largest and deepest technological markets in the world? U.S., sure. Now, according to your hypothesis earlier, that Mm. should not be the case because patents are the antithesis of 
group chain, group work, etc. The internet was dis- was discovered and proliferated in the U.S. Sure, which is all the open cell source phone, software, like the, the automobile, majority. the telephone, yeah, yeah. the television, etc. Yeah. These were all patented, by the way. Okay. Ah, but those are physical things. They are different. Like I mean, the internet is like, not physical. Yeah, the, the internet like, all, all of the current software. Like I mean, no. the, the 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 most recent case in in America was the Supreme Court 2019, which was Alice Corporation versus CLS. 20, that that invalidated that basically invalidated all software patents patents in the U.S. No, so, that's like, not true. That that's not true. A it was a 2019. That was much earlier. Okay. I mean, the final and, supreme judgment was 2019. Oh, well, they might have been supreme, but it didn't invalidate it because I have a software patent. Yes, but but as I said, like U.S. patents don't actually get invalidated until they're tested by litigation. Like invalidated. No, so, so that's not true, though. I mean, it, that's just factually not true. Okay. You oh, oh, you can it. absolutely go and invalidate them before, but most people don't choose to invalidate a patent until it comes to litigation because why, why bother standing in front of a judge and arguing why a patent is invalid? So the way this works, patents are usually invalidated through the USPTO. Yep. Okay? There's a, there's a period where you could go to USPTO and do yep. it. Okay? So the USPTO fought for seven years to try to invalidate the patent themselves and couldn't or didn't. It's highly unlikely that someone's going to get them to do it after the fact. Okay, uh, which means then no, it's a it's a standard challenge. It's a one hundred and one challenge in the U.S. courts. I, I, if, I understand. If, if someone comes to you, if one of you someone comes to you after Alice twenty nineteen, if someone comes mm-hmm. to, like just for background, right? Like I okay. I have done several patents. I have a legal right. background, and I have mm-hmm. like spoken about the U.S. legal system at length because I've gone through like various forms of basic litigation on patents, like. Right. Since Alice on software, getting a pat like maintaining a patent on a relatively arbitrary 101 check is really difficult because you right. have to you have to argue in front of a court why the patent should still be valid in light of Alice, the Supreme Court judgment of Alice 2019. And right. so the fact that your patent stands as a 2014 priority doesn't actually matter. It only gets tested if it ever gets litigated. Okay, so let's go through it. So um, the best way to do it, and I don't want to, I could go through this in depth, but I don't want to because there's certain things I prefer not to teach people to do. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I'm, my, my hands are tied slightly. <laughs> now, it's not as if you'll succeed in doing this because it's already been tried several times. Right. Um, our, our patents, we've had many, many one-on-one challenges, but we were to defeat all of them. Okay, the one-on-one challenges are not the issue. We were able to push past those, even though there were a lot of them. We were able to push past those fairly easily. The other challenges were a bit of a problem, and we did it over a seven-year period. But if we were to go to court, okay, yeah. um, how should I put this? Here, let me skip to the end. And Alice challenge is not an issue, okay? There are ways around Alice, and it's done. If there wouldn't, there'd, there'd be no blockchain, close to no blockchain patents. As it is, 90% of blockchain applications are denied in the U.S. Uh-huh. And that's as it is. So 9 out of 10 are denied. Sure. And, uh, and the 1 out of 10 is a, you're talking, that is almost 40% lower than the standard uh, emission rate. Right, okay. Uh, or even lower. Roughly every 1 out of, uh, pr- roughly 5 out of 10 patents are granted. 5 out of 10 patents are accepted roughly. in the U.S. Okay. Wow. So now it's 1 out of 10 with uh, the blockchain. Now, once you come to litigation, people don't litigate patents unless they're confident they will win or they're just not using proper math. Unfortunately, number two happens much more often. Um, you can litigate a patent and you can win and it wouldn't be worth it. Because mm-hmm. as long as the patent holder is being reasonable, the reasonable license fee, it's a cost of doing business to be paying it. This is another mythos in the open source community, which is just nonsense from a business perspective. If you can license a patent reasonably, why fight? You fight, you lose. Now you have tripled or quadrupled your expenses. Mm-hmm. Okay. And depending on how the patent is issued, what is issued on, you've also effectively might have put yourself out of business, particularly if you're a blockchain company. You're a company that creates software that large entities build multi-billion dollar revenue streams on top of. You have an IP challenge, okay? That IP challenge is credible. Let's just say it's credible. Whether you win or not, it's irrelevant, it's credible. You're not going to convince American Express to dedicate three or four years 
as they build up stuff on your platform while you litigate IP versus going to a different direction or licensing IP directly. It's simply a bad decision. The reason is from, and I am very objective on this because I'm not a cypherpunk, I'm not a Wall Street guy. I'm literally just a dad of three people. So I see things the way they are. It makes zero sense to fight when you don't have to, especially to fight at a great expense where you have to pause or stall your business. It simply doesn't make sense. Win or lose. With the new um, chairman of the uh, patent office, things will change. They're more patent friendly versus the previous chairman. And now the risk has increased significantly. Okay. And if I was on the other side, I, as I would not challenge it unless the other side was being unreasonable. I use Amazon as a perfect example. Most entities in the crypto space <coughs> use um, servers. They usually don't run their own server space, server farm. They usually contract out. Let's say they use AWS. AWS owns their um, hardware. They own their software. They have some patent technologies. They bring really set to you. Most people pay that without an issue, right? But you have one they're receiving, a, they're receiving a service in that case. Yes, you're receiving a service. You're receiving a service where you're using something that belongs to somebody else. Ah, but with... In with the greatest of respect, no one mm-hmm. knows your patent exists. So like, why, why they're not using a service. You haven't given them a thing and said, Hey, this idea exists. Now you can do this thing that you couldn't do before. Like everyone's already doing. Well, that. when you say no one knows the patent exists, explain that to me. As in like, you know, the, the, the I think no, the, the, I, the, I think one of the reasons that people have such a problem with patents is that, a lot of these ideas come like simultaneously or many people invent at the same time. And it's often just because of there's a sufficient technology advancement and sufficient possibilities that people have looked forward and gone, oh, I could do this thing now. It's possible. But they didn't go out and go, I wonder if someone has got can help me work out how to do this thing. They just sat down and invented it and carried on with their day. And with AWS, what you do is you need someone to run a server for you, so you pay for it. So the idea of paying for an idea that you independently came up with just because someone wrote to the patent office and said, I came up with this idea versus paying for a service, they are two very different things because one, I actually receive benefit. I was in a pl- I'm in a place that I wasn't in before, as in I have a service. Whereas in the other state, I'm n- I'm not. I'm in exactly the same place. I'm just now being told that I have to pay someone for the use of now, an I'll, idea. I'm going to ask permission to jump in and cut you off, but sure. not to be rude. But no, no, go for it, please. Chunks, okay. Yeah. So what you're doing is you are now not recognizing the concept of property again. AWS has property, their hardware server form. Mm-hmm. They're leasing it out to you. You're yeah. recognizing that's their, their property. Yep. But you're not recognizing that someone's intellectual property is their property. Okay. Let's take the real property, which is very easy for everybody to understand. Yeah. You have land. Yep. You purchase that land. You have yep. title to it. Somebody walks on that land. They can walk on it inadvertently. Say, I didn't know this was Pierce's land. Okay. Yeah. That does not invalidate Pierce's title to that land. It doesn't mean it wasn't his land. You walked on it. You didn't know. No problem. So we're not going to punish you for that because you didn't know. But you still have to pay to use his land. That's called, a, as you know, you say you're familiar with IP. That's compensatory damages. Okay. Now, if you insist on staying on that land after you know, well, now there's a problem. So now yep. there's a punitive damage. Okay. Yeah. Either way, it's still your property. Now you can bring Pierce to court and you can fight with him over whether it's this land or not. And you could spend money on lawyers yeah. or you could pay to be on the land, which is my point. Yeah. Okay. Is it really worth going to court and fighting versus, you know, paying to be on that land? Let's suppose it is. Okay. Sure. Pierce has a very, very valid cause of action. Here's my deed. It was given to me by the government. The government says I own this land. Yeah. The other side says, well, I don't believe in property, and I don't believe that Pierce can own this land because that land should belong to everybody. Do they have a certain ethos and belief? Okay. Now, when you reverse this situation, everybody becomes instant intellectual property uh, believers. Because when it's their land and Pierce walks on it, everybody can perfectly understand that property belongs to them. I paid money on it, I for it, I worked hard, I developed the land, I cut the trees down, I did, et cetera. Yeah. Now they understand property perfectly. Yeah. 
let's, let's fast forward to today, and then I'll, you know, I'll let you, I'll uninterrupt you. Let's fast forward <laughs> to today, okay? <laughs> the most successful DeFi projects, uh-huh. I happen to believe, are infringing on a patent because they're doing exactly what I laid out back in 2013. Right. They, they didn't start doing it until roughly 2018, 2017, 2019. So, you know, the discussion of who came up with it first is really moot because it's not first to invent, it's first to file in the U.S. Yeah. But I'm more than happy to do it first to invent first, as well. First but, to file, I mean, there are some important prefaces to that, though. It's like, it's first to file as long as you have, in good faith, disclosed all prior art that's relevant. No problem. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> It, and, now, and, 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 and if there is well, one second discussing that in this context, um, if you look at our prosecution history, you know, like I said, this was a knockdown drag out battle over seven years. This isn't something that got issued in 30 days. So, you know, sure. But I mean, like, to, like I've done patents that have taken five years. Like it's not unusual for something to take a long time to, to file. It is for seven years. Take a look. Take most of the stuff that I've been running for seven years. Someone has just given up on it. It hasn't kicked. We actively prosecuted over seven years. Mm-hmm. Was it seven? Six, seven, eight years, actually. Actively prosecuted, okay? But right. now not to have that discussion because that's sort of a tangential discussion. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so um, where was I? Where did I leave off? Yeah, sorry, you, you were saying that the, uh, the, the um, people like Compound, et cetera, are infringing oh, on oh, your entire oh, like, com- like, like So Compound and Uniswap, and all these others, okay? What are they doing now that's different right. from your, from your what, what is Compound doing? I mean, it's a lending, oh, Uniswap. It's a lend, lending protocol. Uniswap is an exchanging protocol, sure. Right, they're claiming their IP. Uniswap has put a restrictive commercial license on their IP. So according to your thesis in the beginning, I set you up with this because I have this conversation all the time, Right. Uniswap is antithetical to all Oh, I source. agree. I agree with that. And okay. I think that's why they're losing the battle, like, you know, versus Aave. I think that the, 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 the community... No, Aave's doing it too. Aave's not. I mean, Uniswap is. I agree with uh-huh. Uniswap, but they also have a, a, a restrictive license, but Aave is still open source. Um, and Aave's number well, one right now, and it's double yeah. compound. Yeah, well, yeah, this, I can, I'm going to predict the future, mm-hmm. right? And I don't really predict the future. You know, and I never really said I predict the future in the past. I thought that's a joke. What I do is I take a very analytical look at the history. Yeah. Yeah. I take a spreadsheet, this fancy new device that uses math, simple math. I calculate things, and then yeah. I see what the future will portend. It's yeah. not a prediction. It's actually just common sense, right? You, if you are going to have stakeholders and you're going to have competition that is well-funded and well-financed, you're going to have to own your IP going forward simply because you cannot sell something and compete when someone can replicate it quickly and sell it, particularly if you put resources in it developing it. Okay, this is when that pharmaceutical um, example comes in, yeah. but it comes in particularly, it's particularly astute or yeah. acute in this so, particular industry. So um, I, think, I think that's a really interesting, like, so let, let's just double click on that a little bit, right? Okay. Pharmaceutical company researches mm-hmm. for... 10 years to right. find a molecule that cures some obscure, uh, some popular form of cancer, right? Okay. And they then release a drug. Now, the molecule is pretty simple, and it's easy for any competitor to go and have a look at that molecule and that combination or in the drug and go, I can reverse engineer that. Now, mm. that competitor is now in a position that they would not have been had it not been for the invention of that company, right? Mm -hmm. So they benefit from the intellectual property, from the novel invention of what has been created. And in that case, society generally agrees and says, that is a good reason for patents because this person did a very large amount of research and work and the competition, as a result of that research and work, can now benefit, and they should pay if they want to benefit for all of that intellectual property research and work. This is the, this is exactly the same as the as the analogy that you're talking about with regards to use of property versus uh-huh. use of intellectual property. I pay 
AWS for a service that I would not have got otherwise. What I'm saying when I say no one knows about your patent is that mm -hmm. there is no, no one has gained a benefit in the use in you doing the work in creating the patents in the first place. Instead, mm -hmm. what you're doing is you are charging a rent on people who have independently come up with an idea and built it into a business. And that is where I think the separation, the moral line separation falls into what okay. society says, right. yes, that's fine, versus society okay. should say, no, that's basically patent trolling. Okay, so freeze right there. Okay. I independently find your apartment at 42 Rugby Road. Mm -hmm. I move in. I set up shop. Mm -hmm. What you're saying is that is morally acceptable. No, I don't know why I said that. I don't know why I did that. No, that's if not, that was morally that, acceptable. That, that's, no, not, no, that, if, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying yeah, if, if that's, it, now, it, now, if, if we break it down to the basic piece system, because, you know, of course, when he would have to say, it, it, if I independently come across property that you already own, right? And you purchased before I got there. But the thing is, is that you're, the, 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 this is why ideas, the, the idea of owning ideas is a legal fiction versus the idea of, and like legal fictions are still enforceable. I'm not saying they're not, but it is very different from physical property because only one of us can own this mug, this mug, but mm -hmm. many of us can independently come up with an idea. The question right. isn't the, the question. And it's in the patent test is, is it so novel that it warrants a patent because humanity the, the, the man on the street would not have, or someone reasonably, what's the, the actual phrase? Someone reasonably... Reasonably skilled in the art. Yeah. yeah I got you. Go ahead. Yeah. And, and, and I think, I think that's, uh, that, that, that is the line that the patent law draws as well, right? Okay. It's, not, it's, not the same as, it's not the same as physical property because only one person can own it individually. And like intellectual property well, that's is... That's not true, but I got is, your point. Is <laughs> double, I got your point. It, yeah, sure. And, the, and like intellectual property is... Doubly so, because actually you have to own it in each jurisdiction. You may own it in the US, but you don't own it in the UK. You don't own it in China, et cetera, because of this legal fiction. And actually, you can have many examples where someone uh -huh. owns an idea, a, a patent in one jurisdiction, and someone else owns the same patent on the same thing, written in a different way in a different jurisdiction, right? And then you have, okay. then, then have cross-jurisdictional um, litigation around these things. So, like... The legal fiction is the legal fiction because multiple people can own an idea or come up with an idea independently versus a property, which only one person can like, I mean, you're right. Multiple people are going to own if you have all of the legal agreements or whatever, but there's only one physical building, right? Right. But see, the, my issue with that is just because it's not physical doesn't mean it's not property. And it doesn't mean, you know, someone didn't come up with it. The argument, and I'm not necessarily pro content. I am pro property and pro capitalist. I am, you know, but that's just my personal preference. I'm not trying to force it upon anybody else. So, <laughs> I, you know, and I'm not. It's a system I, that I, works. I, it is a system that works. Well, well, it's, it's, done, it's, done, it's done wonders for the U.S. Sure. If you take a look at where property rights are very strong, yeah. and then you take a look at their economies, and the yeah. U.S., the, the second strongest patent system is probably Japan. Okay? Look at Japan's economy, look at their, technolog their technological progress, right? Whenever you have a strong patent system, you have a very strong technology um, environment behind it, market, and a very strong financial market and a strong economy. And it runs lockstep. So, you know, even I think it would be a very a full argument, but let's say you make the argument that the U.S. is a fluke. Mm -hmm. Is Japan a fluke? Israel, South Korea? I mean, everywhere you have a strong patent system, you have a strong technological market and a strong economy. I, I'm, not dis I'm, I'm not disagreeing with the idea. I mean, like the OECD also say, right, that the rule of law and uh, property rights are two of the most important concepts to 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 create a, uh, a successful economy. Like as soon as you start under uh, undermining those, then you create less successful economies. I'm not disagreeing with that. Like. What I'm what I'm saying is that they are not equivalent. The law doesn't view them as equivalent. It like as as what uh, property in a building versus property in an idea. They are not equivalent in how they're described in the law. They're not equivalent in how they're chosen to be granted, and they're certainly not equivalent 
in how they're enforceable, right? Like the enforceability, like I don't have to go, generally speaking, I don't have to go to court to prove that the house is mine, but I do have to go to court to prove to my idea is novel enough for me to justify to have a patent over it in the first place. Well, not to pick words, but why wouldn't you have to go to court to prove the house is yours? We get into a, a squabble over your real property right. or personal property. The first thing as the plaintiff is your burden of proof, which is to prove it's yours. Right. And in first America, that's actually harder first. than it is in the UK. Like in the UK, it's, you have digital property registry. You go, look, it's mine. Well, I, <laughs> I don't want to have to defend America on many aspects. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I don't want to sound like I'm unpatriotic. I'm a big patriot. But, you know, there's certain things broken here. So right. I don't want to be in a position I have to defend. Sure. But as the plaintiff, the burden of proof is on you. And the first order of the day is to prove that you own it. Right. Without proof of ownership, then you have no cause of action, correct? Right. But and, and, okay, and so but, 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 it, but it's two tests for patents. It's not do you, do you proving that you own the piece of paper. It's, it's also proving that it's novel enough for you to justify okay. for the patent not to be invalid, which is right. interesting because it's not saying that an idea in and itself is property. It's saying that an idea that is novel enough to be granted a patent is mm-hmm. property, which is a different right. thing. It's not saying all right. ideas are property. It's saying some ideas are property, which is why, again, it's a legal fiction. We just have this way of determining the legal fiction of that property. Uh, well, again, you know, I, I enjoy this conversation, but um, just like all land is not owned by somebody, and it's true, right? right. You have land that hasn't been claimed yet, it hasn't been titled. So it hasn't been known. So not all the land is someone's property. Right. Some land is someone's property. So there is a comparison. The difference is primarily go to support your idea, but not for the reason that you're espousing it. The reason why a lot of intellectual property is um, claimed and enforced differently is because intellectual property is more ephemeral. So in jurisdictions, you have a 17-year limit, 20-year limit, 25-year limit. Right. And after that limit, then the patent rights or monopoly is lifted and everybody can use it. Right. Because I would assume, first and foremost, is the ephemeral nature and the different nature of intellectual property versus real personal property. Right. Okay. But that's not what I'm arguing. I actually agree with you on that one. What I'm arguing is it is still property. Okay. Everybody can understand property very well when it's their property. Yeah. Most of the intellectual property. Um, arguments come from someone trying to use someone else's property. Yeah, I, so, I, I feel like there's definitely, like, just, just to close out, there's definitely motivated reasoning on both sides here, right? Like, the, the motivated reasoning on your side is, is I want my patent to be valid because I would like to be able to enforce it against people who I feel are, are infringing my patent so that I can receive royalties from it. There's a monetary incentive for it. And I have an incentive in the DeFi space being open and uh, and um, uh, open source and free movement of ideas as mu- for as long as possible because I think fundamentally that that will mean that innovation moves quicker and that we'll able we'll be able to build a bigger system as a result of that, especially in the starting days. Your prediction. Well, are- let, let me just uh, time out, uh, if you don't mind. Sure. So you're posing an argument as if they're mutually exclusive. They're not. You know, you pay the fee, you use it. If the fee is draconian, then I can see where it can impede practice. If the fee is business-like, it doesn't impede practice at all. I mean, uh, impede progress at all. You know, so it's a full argument to say patent or, you know, um, open development or rapid development. That's just not the case. You know, the largest productivity, the largest, one second, the largest productivity software package in the world is cold source and commercial. It has grown to the point where it has been the standard for 40 years. Okay? And it's cold source and commercial and it's expensive, which, you know, the prices are going down. Um, the second largest is also cold source, which is Google. So in case everybody doesn't get it, you have Microsoft Office, you have Google Docs. The third probably is. The actual open source ones are so far down on the totem pole as did not register. So just because someone owns and profits from their ideas doesn't mean it impedes progress. Now, I can understand making that argument, but the argument doesn't hold water. Just like comparing the US and Japan and South Korea and soon China, because China is flying on the uh, IP registrations, but each economy that has 
uh, or each country that has a strong patent system and property laws also has the deepest, broadest, and fastest growing technological market and economies. So the ethos I do understand, but it is just not backed up factually. And I can give you many, many examples. Yeah, I mean, I, it, the thing is, is like, so the, the, the counterpoint to that is the reason that public ledgers are likely to succeed over private ledgers, which is my view that public ledgers will succeed over private ledgers in the first time. I agree. Time, I agree. Is because of their open permissionless nature. I don't have to talk right. to anyone to use it. I can just go ahead and use it. And like uh -huh. any friction you put in front of business, even it is just the, a question of calling up Reggie and saying, hey, I'd like to you know, pay you a cent every time someone uses my protocol, someone uses my DeFi application as friction, right? Okay. But the way you work it again, you know, if someone uses their own protocol, they don't have to call Reggie. If someone uses Reggie's protocol, you don't have to call Reggie. I don't need to talk to you if I build my own house on my own land. There is no friction. Yes. If I decide to build a house in your apartment, yes. I should talk to you. So again, you know, the, the, the thing is, the thing is, is that matter. all of this conversation has, has, has centered on this idea that real property and intellectual property are the same thing. And they're not legally like as a fact, as a legal fact in law in America and in the UK and in Europe, they are not the same concept in law. Right. Like you can call them property, but in terms of everything to do with the legislation around them, I can't apply property legislation that actually ad ad adheres to pro physical property to intellectual property. Like they are different sets of legislation. They are fundamentally different. So like saying they're the same isn't true. Like you, we can, we can, we can have an intellectual argument or philosophical debate about whether or not they, that, that we can think about them in the same way, but like, as a fact, they're not true in law. They're not, they're okay. not the same in law. So here's a fact. The first paragraph on the patent that comes on the cover of the patent, sure. right? It's actually very short. What does it say? Uh, the first paragraph on a patent. The, the um, cover, the, the folder that comes in the U.S. patent. As a golden you, boss and you, you it basically me. says, right, you have been given, given rights of ownership to this property yep. or this idea concept. You have the right to um, forbid somebody from using it without your consent and permission. Okay. And they cannot use it without your consent. That basically says this is yours. So that's a fact. And it's actually written on every single patent grant in the U.S. Okay. That fact says you can go and build your own system, protocol, house, whatever, and use it. And you don't need to ask, you know, Bartholomew for anything. If you use Bartholomew's, which is protected, where the U.S. government says it is his, you do have to ask. The reason you have to ask is because it is his and not yours. Uniswap's a perfect example, okay? And Compound, you have the idea that Richard came up with. It was patented. Bancor came with an idea, very similar. Actually, it was the same idea. So Uniswap, sorry, Bancor was before Uniswap. Bancor was before, Bancor was before Uniswap. Yeah, yeah, Reggie yeah. was before Bancor. Right, right, okay. Right. Reggie came with an idea. Bancor, mail copy, mail came up with it. It's irrelevant. Okay. Right. The ownership is there. Right. The guy who's from Brooklyn, the same area part of town I'm from, right, came, right. He fought Bancor's idea, made some changes, came up with Uniswap. And then these guys came up with something called sushi swap. Came, fought Uniswap's idea, yeah. created sushi swap. Yeah. Took a lot of liquidity. Then these other guys came up, backed by Binance. Pancake swap came and fought Uniswap and came up with the pancake swap. And it goes on down the line. Okay, why does Reggie feel he has some rights to ownership from it? Because that idea was original. And it was copied and copied and copied and copied. There is no original idea there. The only original idea was the one that I came up with. And I'm not banging anybody's head saying, come and give me money. I'm not. But let's keep it factual. So by copying ideas So you're not, you're ideas not looking over, to enforce your patent? You're not going to patent? I, I am going to enforce a patent, but That's banging I don't people's believe, heads, isn't it? No, it's not. It's not. Yeah. Just like AWS, you know. AWS, if you... You, if you rented a large amount of service space and whatever from AWS getting and you a chose service. not to we, pay We've them. gone through this. I'm getting a service. Okay. I'm not getting a okay. service if, I'm, if I invent something. Uh, okay, okay. So if you're not getting a service, 
if ADFS sold you a server, mm-hmm. or somebody sold you, if Dell sold you a server, mm-hmm. okay, right? You're getting a product, mm-hmm. right, that Dell sold you. Mm-hmm. If you choose not to pay for it and Dell came after you, Dell's not banging you over the head. You took the server, okay? If you didn't know it was Dell's server for whatever reason, hard to prove, let's say you didn't know it, no problem. Dell says, okay, that's our server. We'd like for you to pay for it. Right. You either pay for it. I think it's instructive that all of the examples that you're coming with are examples about real property. And like, as I've said, they don't, the, the law is not the same. The legislation is not the same. You're, you're applying, you're, 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 you're bringing together two concepts which are legally separate. Okay, so let's so use like, intellectual I, property. Like so we're going to use intellectual property. property. It's the word we're intellectual. Going to, intellectual. So we're, property. Going, we're going to use intellectual property. Right. Okay, um, you create a song. Let's yeah. say the Beatles or Michael Jackson beat yeah. it. Yeah. Okay, and then you take that song. Yeah. And then you replicate it and you sell it for profit. Yeah. Right. The owners of Michael Jackson's song says that's our song. Yeah. You choose to use it anyway. They're not beating you over the head, right? You're taking their property after being notified it's their property. Yep. Okay. It's really just simple. But you know, the beating same over the test, head thing. like Reggie, it's the same test. If you watch any of the litigation in in music, in in the music scene, mm-hmm. it's the same test. Would this artist have created this track without the input of this? previous track was it okay, based that, on this prior art but, 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 it's the same but, test for enforcement that, that's a di- that's a different discussion or argument than what we're making so we, we can do that but you know we got to do like one one tranche at a time so right but but, you're, but what, you, what you keep coming back to is this idea of someone using someone else's idea right and the test is the always idea. could they have done it without knowing about that person's idea, which is the test in how, whether or not a patent is valid. It's like, okay, so, so, so let's put it this way. Is it, is that a test that has to be passed in order to get a patent? Yes. Okay. So the patent is granted. So the test is passed. So we can no, put that to the no, side. That's not how it okay. works. I'm afraid. It, uh, like, I, a, I, 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 trust me, after seven years of but, but a, pa- a patent can be overthrown <laughs> through litigation. You can go to yes. court and you can overthrow a patent, which means uh, that, 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 that it is, is not that it is, is not a hard and fast fact that if a patent is granted, that it is valid. Right? Okay, that but is that, but repeatedly hold, shown okay, not to be the case. I, throughout the course of this conversation, you're taking a concept and then you're extrapolating it past, you know, what the con. With the sorry, original concept of God. No, I, don't I, I, did, I did debating in university. I'm just so used to <laughs> no, and, taking and people's ideas and like playing. And, 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 actually, that is very good as long as the other side doesn't catch you. Okay, so, but, and I don't mind doing that. So, we, and I want to discuss that. We're going to do this, you know, one tranche at a time or we can't get the you know, okay. whole discussion done. So, the novelty and inventive step is taken care of. Mm-hmm. Okay, it can be challenged. Yep. But the USPTO's job is to challenge it up front. I have nothing against the patent examiner personally, but he was really, really rigorous. I like you're not giving anybody else such a hard problem. Okay. I am confident it can't get knocked down on the venture step. I'm quite confident. Okay. Because trust me, he tried and he put the resources of the government behind trying. Okay. If it's challenged in court, no problem. So let's suppose. Let's look at it from our perspective of come up with idea 2013, implement 2014. Okay. Someone has been trying and they started, they came up with the idea and they came up and four or five years later. Okay. I think the inventive step argument is, you know, um, obvious in fact. Now, over time, someone's always going to be able to come up with that. In a million years, will someone come up with an idea that you came up with? That was inventive now? Quite possibly. Sure. Okay. But there's this common sense argument that my son uh, or my daughter came over. She's 16. And she says, well, if it was so obvious, then why didn't any of us come up with it? Okay. Now, if it's a matter of everybody, like with the, you, you know, the Alexander Graham Bell story and um, how he filed the patent. Are you familiar with that? I mean, okay, I so. no, 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 go on. Okay. Well, well he, he, Alexander Graham Bell filed an improvement on um, the telegram, telegraphy, uh, te- telegraphy, telegraphy, right? Which is basically the telephone. Um, there was somebody else who was to file that same day, but he gave it to his assistant to file and the assistant decided to go eat lunch. 
after lunch, he got to the patent office. It was closed, and Bell's patent came in a day early, priority day. And there was a third patent that also was filed that week. Afterwards, Bell got his patent, and he had challenges to it. How many challenges do you think Bell had to his telephone patent? If you had to take a guess. A lot. A lot of money in it, right? 600. Sure. 600 challenges. Yeah. Fought off all 600 of it, and he controlled basically communication for almost the next 100 years so the government broke it up. After the government broke it up, it reformed. The AT&T came and still one of the behemoths. Okay? But that being said, and I talked so long, again, I forgot what I was telling the story. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> I'm talking, trying to figure out why I started this. But um, long story short is if ownership is given, then ownership is given. If, if you want to challenge it in court, you can't. Okay? And if I was a other side, to decide whether I challenge the coin, it's a math equation. It literally is. You know, it has nothing to do with my ethos or ethics or anything. It's a math equation. Is my operation more profitable licensing it, buying it, or fighting? Okay? So I went through the Alexander Great Bell story, but I got off on a tangent and I forgot where I was going. But long story short, um, it's property until proven otherwise. Um, invalidating patents is going to be more difficult now because you had a change in administration, um, as I understand it. But whether you do it or not should be a math equation. It really should. Um, I think people are being unduly influenced by legal counsel. And legal counsel gets paid for fighting. So legal counsel gets paid for fighting, right? So you have to put that in, in perspective. And I'm simply guessing why people choose to fight when it's least profitable, just like I'm at a loss as why people wouldn't file for patents. You should file for a patent all the time, you know, then you have ownership of it. What you do with your property, your ownership is up to you. Okay. But you have the option versus inventing something and not having ownership of it and then having someone take ownership of it and use it against you. That's what the patent is for. You know, that's the situation that we're in now. If I didn't file this patent, everybody would be using this idea. You'd have the Jack Dorsey's of the world create the corpus and basically um, go after the small entrepreneurs who had the ideas and steamroll them, which is exactly, you know, what it looks like it's happening. Copa was built to be allegedly a defensive mechanism. And as soon as they were incorporated, the first thing they did was what? Offensively sue an entrepreneur, an unpopular entrepreneur, but entrepreneur nonetheless, and one that did not sue them. You know, what that is, is a trust. It's the old trust that Delano Roosevelt tried to break with his antitrust. And the fact that the open source populace does not see things for the way they are, but what they're told is disturbing. It's very easy to create a boogeyman, like the patent troll boogeyman, to alter narrative when all you have to do is take a look at the landscape yourself. You don't have to be smart, just take a look at it. Very seldom would a collection of centered billionaire companies get together, right, for the good of the small entrepreneur or the consumer. I haven't seen it happen at all. I'm 54 and I'm well-versed in finance and valuation of companies, okay? Um, without the patent, we'd be ass out of luck. You know, we didn't get to discuss how well I was treated by the government um, because of my lack of political capital because I don't have access to that capital or how I've been treated by the private equity and venture capital communities because of my lack of financial capital and being excluded from the old boys club. And basically the only saving grace that we have, despite the fact we came up with this idea very early and executed very well, is the fact that we actually own the idea. You know, so I am not into beating everybody up, but I'm very, very pro property and pro patent because it allowed me to take ownership of my idea. And without that, you probably would have never heard of me except for the by many macro calls in the past. So that's it in a nutshell. I had a very strong point to make, and I was trying to build up to it with Alexander Graham Bell, but I was talking too long, and I forgot what that great point was. So I am I'm sure that we can have a, a round two on this at some point. It's been such a pleasure talking with you, Reggie. I appreciate you staying um, so game to have a, a proper discussion on this. I think um, some really interesting ideas have been raised and uh, I really hope that everyone enjoyed listening to it. So thank you so much for coming on the show. Um, and I, yeah, I wish you all the best of luck in all of your endeavors. Okay, but well, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.